Welcome back to Real Vision Pro Crypto. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Emin Goon Sear, CEO of Ava Labs and co-founder of Layer One Blockchain Avalanche. Emin, welcome back to Real Vision. So nice to be here, Ash. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Great to have you on the platform again. Uh, let's get started for folks who are new uh, to the Ava ecosystem. Talk a little bit about first your background. It's an interesting one on the academic side, your involvement with digital currencies goes back many years, 20 years, I believe, longer than Bitcoin has been in existence. Talk a little bit about your background. Sure. I got started in the space back in 2002, back when peer-to-peer -peer computing was just uh, hitting the, the airwaves and everybody was excited about file sharing. And back in that, in those days, it was uh, the problem was that people wanted to download files but not upload them. So I, I thought that uh, what the world needed was a currency called Karma, uh, that you need that you would use to download files, and if you ran out, then you would be forced to have to upload as well. So that was the that was my solution at the time to the common uh, the, the well known problem the the tragedy of the commons. So uh, the karma system is very well known academically. It had uh, one key element in it known as proof of work minting. So um, and that was back developed in two thousand and two, published in two thousand and three. Uh, so that predates Satoshi by six years or so. Um, and then, uh, uh, but my timing was absolutely horrible, right? That was right after 9-11. Everybody was concerned about terrorist financing. And all my uh, mentors said, look, this is interesting stuff, but uh, you'll never find, uh, as a young assistant professor, you'll never find uh, funding for this. And they were right. So I left the field um, and Satoshi came along. And uh, let's be clear, he one-upped karma in a major, major way by folding the consensus protocol back into the minting process. So he improved on it uh, immensely. Um, I then uh, looked at, uh, at Bitcoin. I found the biggest known flaw in Bitcoin, known as selfish mining. Everybody denied that there was such a flaw because Satoshi, of course, is, has to be infallible. Um, I got a lot of death threats. There were various efforts funded to disprove what we did. All of those efforts folded in on themselves and turned around and said, Selfish mining is a thing, it still is a thing, and we encounter it in the wild every now and then. Anyhow, it's a long story from there on, but um, I worked on every aspect of cryptocurrency since then. I worked on security, or I worked on scalability, I worked on characterizing existing systems as, as well as developing new ones like Bitcoin Next Generation, uh, like uh, the uh, various other work we did on Layer 2s. But it all culminated in this new system called Avalanche that we launched about uh, three and a half years ago. Yeah, I should say you mentioned this idea of the academic uh, sort of framework. Uh, you're someone who has a PhD in computer science. I uh, spent time at Princeton at Cornell, uh, very serious on the academic computer science background. Uh, Emin, let me ask this. The first question that people have in 2024 about layer one protocols is usually, why do we need another one? What is the raison d'etre of AVAX? Talk a little bit about how you see it big picture fitting into the layer one ecosystem, which is increasingly becoming a crowded space. Sure. Um, there are a couple of reasons for why you need a, a much better system. That the, the, There's a couple of reasons why Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana will not cut it for us. And uh, they are very simple. Uh, reason number one is that uh, the consensus protocol used in these chains falls into one of two categories. It's either proof of work based, like Bitcoin, or it's proof of stake based and, and uses what we call classical consensus protocols that require all to all communication. So Ethereum, for example, Solana, for example, perform a lot of communication in order to come to consensus on each and every block. And that messaging, the amount of messaging required for all validators to communicate with all other validators is so high that, uh, that these protocols have severe scalability limitations. Now, that's reason one, and the, re the, the way Avalanche improves on this is that uh, it introduced to the world third, a, a third class, a third family of consensus protocols that was not seen before in academic circles or in any other circle. So uh, the, the Avalanche consensus protocol does not require every validator to talk to every other one. It uses something kind of like the gossip systems um, or the gossip networks that people are familiar with from real life. Um, I don't need to talk to everyone. I just need to talk to enough people who have spoken to enough people such that I have high assurance that we all agree. 
So that's the key insight behind the avalanche system. It's a major, major uh, breakthrough in, in distributed system science. And that's the reason why I left Cornell and decided to take this, this big academic breakthrough uh, to industry by myself. But there's a second reason that makes uh, avalanche very different from the other systems. And that is the fact that it's a multi-chain system. Bitcoin is a single chain with a single asset on it. It's the Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum is a multi-asset single chain system. Solana is a multi-asset single chain system. Avalanche was built from the get-go to support multiple chains. Each and every one of those chains has, can have its own rules. And in fact, sometimes these rules are different because of technical reasons. You want to do something different. Your assets are different, etc. But sometimes they're jurisdictional. Uh, sometimes you want to have something like, look, this is going to be a chain that's regulated for people who live in the United States. This is going to be a chain that's regulated according to, to, to uh, GDPR in the EU, and so on and so forth. So we can actually support the jurisdictional differences, the legal requirements that, are, that, are, uh, that come into play anytime you interact with the actual real world. So we differ in philosophy, and we differ, differ in ethos than many other systems. We don't need the world to conform to us. We can build things that actually integrate well into the real world, and we can build chains that communicate seamlessly with each other. And so that puts us in a unique category. There are two other um, multi-chain systems, and of those, you know, I'll name them Polkadot and uh, Cosmos. Avalanche is, uh, is, there are differences between Avalanche and those as well. They're a little bit more nuanced, uh, but, uh, uh, but I think uh, the, the audience should be able to see that a, a multi-chain system is inherently more versatile than a single chain system. It can handle many competing applications while providing isolation between them. A highly popular application on Ethereum will, for example, cause gas prices to spike. And in contrast, that's not gonna be the case for Avalanche because Avalanche uh, applications can each and every one of them have their own chains. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. So you sketched out the two functional, main functional differences there, uh, which are a novel consensus protocol on the one hand in a native organic multi-chain universe on the other. Let's break those down a little bit practically and talk about how that functions in the real world. Let's start with the consensus mechanism. Talk a little bit about how that impacts the use cases, what advantages you believe it confers for end users. Sure. Um, the main advantage that uh, the Avalanche Consensus Protocol provides is that it's of much higher performance. And by performance, I mean two things. It provides much lower latencies and it provides higher capacity. So let me break that down. By latency, what we mean is the time between submitting an application and that application finding its slot in the blockchain, becoming finalized, having the effect that the user, user wanted. And uh, so, uh, so that's, you want that to be as fast as possible. Because you want to build a factory that, uh, you know, from, from the moment you put the raw inputs into it, produces something on the output, right? If you're building a car factory, you put, it, you put in some metal, and a, and a you know, hunk of metal and, and, a, and a car comes out the other side as quickly as possible. When we were starting out, people did not appreciate how important this was. When Ethereum 2 was being designed, they did not appreciate how important this was. Full finalization in Ethereum, for example, takes a, a very large number of, uh, of, uh, of blocks that corresponds to about two and a half minutes. Um, and uh, in many other systems, when you submit your, your transaction, they pretend that it's actually making its way to the blockchain. But oftentimes, uh, what they're doing is they're hiding the fact that it didn't actually finalize yet. They're, they pretend in the user interface, like, okay, you, you sent your application, but, but that, uh, that transaction may or may not find its way to the, the blockchain. And, uh, and you, it, during times of congestion, you get these terrible user experiences where you, know, you submitted something, you tried to, for example, fulfill a collateral obligation, you sent your transaction, but it didn't make it on the other side. And you can get liquidated. It can have severe financial uh, uh, implications for the users. Whereas with Avalanche, you submit it, and within the blink of an eye, within about a second or two, we always advertise a second or two, 
when we actually measure it these days, we're getting about 740 milliseconds. So it's actually less than a second. Uh, so within a second or so, uh, the transaction is taken from the user and fully finalized. It's done. And it's so fast that it's kind of like interacting with a web service, even though it's not a centralized web service. It's the exact opposite. So that's the fast latency improvement that Avalanche Consensus brings. The second one, of course, has to do with uh, the, red, the, the way the system is architected, which is the capacity of the system. We may measure that by throughput, the number of transactions that, uh, that the system can clear. Think of it as not as uh, the speed of the factory, but as the, the capacity of the factory to produce cars at the same time. So imagine you could build a factory that takes a month to generate a car, but it generates 10 cars at a time, right? In fact, many of our competitors were sacrificing latency to get throughput. So they were trying to, for example, uh, build ever larger factories that take longer, but they work in parallel and they have these big doors out of which come many cars at, at the same time. So they're trying to improve throughput, but to do that, they had to build these really, really large uh, operations, really large uh, processes that were slow to go through from the beginning to, to the end. What distinguishes Avalanche is the fact that it has both fast latency and high capacity. So those two features are critical. And, um, and of course, uh, for people who really like to delve deep, there is one additional feature that the Avalanche consensus protocol brings us, and that has to do with the gossip-based mechanism that's being used for consensus. In particular, uh, because not every validator has to talk to every other validator. You can, have, um, you can have really large validator sets. You can have a very, very decentralized system because it's actually feasible to coordinate between 10,000 or maybe 100,000 or even millions of validators if necessary. No other consensus protocol can say this. So, um, for example, Ethereum 2 cannot do this. It's based on all-to-all -all communication and uh, uh, when they have large numbers of validators, what they do is they, they cut uh, the validator set into smaller quorums, into smaller sets of, uh, of people who make a decision for a given slot. So what they're really doing is, okay, of the people who are participating in the system, we're only going to let this set to determine what happens in the next time slot. That's a strange thing to be doing. It's a compromise from the decentralization principles of crypto. Avalanche does not have to do that. We can have as many, uh, as many validators as, as one can throw at us, and uh, by virtue of the logarithmic scaling properties of, of gossip protocols or gossip-like protocols, uh, the avalanche consensus mechanism can handle millions of participants. And that's, uh, that's sort of the, the cool thing that, uh, that we get by using an entirely different protocol. I mean, for folks who are listening, who hear low latency, high throughput, the system that probably comes to most minds is Solana. How is what you guys are doing at Ava Labs different from what's happening in Solana? Solana is a, is a really, really interesting case study. So uh, uh, it's a system I happen to like quite a bit. And uh, what I think the big uh, difference is between us and Solana is, is the approach. Solana is an engineering-based approach to getting speed, okay, to getting performance. So what does that mean? You take a well-understood uh, consensus protocol, you take all-to-all -all communication, and uh, you try to make it go as fast as possible using engineering principles. So it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like taking a, 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 an internal combustion engine and trying to see, well, what can I attach to this thing to make it go really fast? And they did an admirable job. They, first of all, they threw hardware at the problem, right? So Solana validators have to be really, really big. So you and I, you know, I don't know that I can run a validator for Solana at, the, at this point. So you, normal people cannot participate in that process. It's just, it's getting expensive and difficult. It requires expertise. And then the next thing they did is they, they optimized every aspect of the system so that under regular conditions, Solana, and, you know, under, 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 on a good sunny day, Solana is very fast. So they optimized for the best case. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And uh, the result is a system that is fast, and, 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 and quite fast, actually. In fact, it's the fastest of our competitors. Avalanche is doing something entirely different. 
So we are not engineering-based. I would say we're science-based approach. We use different science. We have a different protocol. We have a different approach. And instead of tweaking engineering knobs on an internal combustion engine, we're bringing a new technology. Think of it as the electric vehicle technology. So we bring an, an electric motor that's potentially much faster, you know, far higher torque, et cetera. And, uh, and so and we're, we're, we're pushing that to its limits. So that's, that's I think, the, the proper analogy to, uh, to Solana and Avalanche. Um, we, for example, have not um, asked our validators to increase their hardware requirements. Uh, Avalanche is currently running on very slow hardware. I think, you know, this laptop that's open in front of me is something that, uh, that can participate. It's, it's above the minimum, minimum viable platform requirements for Avalanche, right? So, uh, so that's quite a, quite, a, um, quite a difference from Solana. We have this ethos of trying to build highly decentralized systems in which anyone can participate, and we haven't yet uh, turned that knob of throwing hardware at the problem. We haven't done, we haven't had time to do the engineering optimizations that Solana has had time to do. So there is a lot of slack that we can pick up that I'm really excited about picking up as time goes on, especially this year. And um, uh, so, so there's a lot of engineering ahead of us that's uh, hopefully going to give us many more gains. And so those are the two big differences between how Solana is constructed and Avalanche. And one last thing I would add, of course, is the architecture. Solana is a single chain. Everything happens on that chain. They do data management very differently than us as well. They discard a lot of past history uh, that Avalanche does not. And so, uh, so they have a different approach, and that's, that those are the techniques they use to get their speed, whereas Avalanche is using a potentially much faster technology, not engineered uh, the way Solana is engineered, um, and uh, uh, not, we have not uh, taken advantage of the optimizations they have brought uh, to the older all-to-all -all communication technology, and, uh, but we are, we're, we're moving in that direction. So it's really exciting. I think Solana is a very, very nice system. It's a very good example of what you can do when you know what you're doing and you, when you apply sound engineering principles to the previous generation of technology. Yeah, it's very interesting just to hear the comparison and to hear you talk about how you think of them. Obviously, uh, that's the view from the avalanche world. I'm sure folks from Solana would see it differently, but it's really interesting to hear you talk about uh, how you see those differences. The other protocol that comes to mind uh, when you're talking about gossip protocols is Hedera Hashgraph. Talk a little bit about any differences or similarities that you see uh, in terms of that protocol. I know that they've uh, also stressed this notion of not being an all-to-all -all protocol, uh, but having a statistically based system uh, that has a gossip based functionality. Any thoughts on that? So um, Adara is using something else. Um, uh, the, the, it's it's uh, sure they are using some gossip-like uh, uh, techniques to get uh, get some performance. Uh, but I, honestly, I haven't looked too carefully into them. Last time I checked, they had twelve participants, twelve validators in their in their uh, in their system. So uh, that that for me did not rise to the level where I would I would expect a decentralized system to be. And where is Avalanche right now in terms of the total number of validators? Uh, I haven't checked like in the last month or so, but last I checked, we were over 1,500 uh, validators. So, uh, and when you compare these things, not everyone calls them the same thing. So uh, I think al almost everybody calls them the same thing except Ethereum. So um, uh, the notion of Ethereum validators is different. So, uh, so each 32 ETH, is, is they consider a different validator, even though a whale could come in and they could have 32,000 ETH and they would consider that 1,000 validators, even though it's the same person, same entity. So uh, normally when we say validator, we, we, we are in distributed system science, we're talking about entities and not, not just coins. So, uh, so let's, uh, one thing I would caution the audience about is the fact that Ethereum is using non-standard terminology that's very, very confusing and misleading. But... Uh, uh, but in terms of uh, of uh, validator count, we are one of the one of the top systems that is that is decentralized. We have a very large number of diverse validators across the globe. So staying with this theme, let's talk a little bit about what Avalanche is doing today in terms of end user functionality, how you see it, uh, what's happening right now in the system for folks who are watching this, trying to get a handle uh, on the space to understand what's actually happening right now on the network. 
what's happening on the network? That's a great question, Ash. It's every morning I wake up, that's the first thing on my mind. Every night, that's the last thing on my mind. And uh, the system is so so large these days that uh, that I have difficulty following up. But uh, let me give you a, a sort of a sense of what's happening on on Avalanche these days. We have multiple chains. That's I think the part that's uh, that creates. Uh, some complexity for people who are following from the sidelines. Um, but uh, we have a chain that we call the platform chain for coordinating all these chains. Think of it as the bulletin board that uh, serves to, to coordinate all other activity in the system. We have a chain called the X chain. It's the asset chain where it's really cheap to create assets. But these are flat, regular assets. You know, just, uh, you know, they don't have programmability. And then we have a chain called the C chain where uh, historically a lot of exciting activity has taken place. That's where the smart contracts are, but there are many other chains. There are, I forget the count right now, but there are quite a few chains on the order of about 100 of them uh, that have both programmability and their own activities. So what's happening on these chains? The C chain has a lot of DeFi activity. Yeah, it's really, really exciting. There is, um, you know, you can... Uh, you can do, you can borrow against your assets, you can create new assets, you can transfer assets very cheaply, very fast on the C chain or on the X chain. Um, so that's, that's one thing that obviously happens on Avalanche. We're very proud of our DeFi, uh, DeFi ecosystem. There are people building exciting applications on top, um, and uh, some of them happen on their own chains. So for example, there are um, there are people who've deployed their own chains for building exchanges. So DEXs on Avalanche, uh, so there are some DEXs, like DEXalot, uh, that operate on their own chain, independently from the main chain, where they pay far lower fees. And that's something that's only possible with our architecture. Um, let's see, there are people building really exciting things in the social fi space. There's something called the Arena uh, that uh, is kind of like France Tech, but uh, but I would say cooler because there's more going on there. There's more you can do on the arena than you could do on France Tech. Um, that's worth a look. Uh, it's kind of like a Twitter clone with tokens involved and uh, and a very vibrant user user group. Um, there are institutions, large Wall Street institutions, building their own subnets. They're building their own chains. So. Um, Think of these as walled gardens. These institutions have really strong compliance requirements. They don't want North Korea coming in and doing stuff. They don't want, you know, obviously bad actors on the counter side of a, of a trade. So for them, what one needed to do was provide a, a, an infrastructure where uh, there's kind of a gating for participants. And, um, and our architecture allows exactly that to happen. I mean, this is such an interesting and important point, I think. Obviously, uh, this is a very new space, significant technological challenges that everyone's working on. I've long believed uh, that many of the most significant challenges facing the space are legal, regulatory, compliance, law enforcement, legislative. Uh, and these are challenges that have real cultural uh, implications for this space. Uh, the idea that there are folks in the space who have very libertarian ideals, uh, also folks in the space who want to use this uh, in ways that Fortune 500 companies, for example, can jump on board and be comfortable that they are compliant uh, with some of their requirements. So you have these sort of divergent use cases, divergent requirements. One of the interesting things about a multi-chain world uh, is that it allows potentially uh, to solve those solutions in ways uh, that could be different for different groups. Talk a little bit about how you think about that from a cultural perspective, how you think about it from a governance perspective. This is a really significant area of development in the space. It, it really is. And I couldn't have uh, stated it as well as you just did, uh, the motivation for it. It's, uh, it's absolutely essential to be able to support institutions' uh, compliance requirements. The world is not going to go overnight into a libertarian paradise if it ever will. So there are reasons why societies enact certain rules that pertain to them. And uh, there are things that you need to do differently in the United States than you, the way you would do them in, in the EU, than the way you would do them in Russia, than the way you would do them in China, than the way you would do them in Japan or India. Each and every one of these societies has different rule sets uh, to which people have to comply. And now those institutions, the compliant uh, institutions, are typically in, 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 uh, in charge of uh, trillions of dollars of assets, and they found it difficult to uh, put those assets on these 
one-size-fits-all chains. So, in fact, when we look back, what we see is, you know, we've got single chains like Bitcoin or single chains like Ethereum. And the rule set embodied in the chain doesn't, doesn't match any given legal jurisdiction, right? Bitcoin does what Bitcoin does. It's got no, no sense of United States requirements, no sense of, oh, you know, these coins belong to this person with these sets of rules, etc. So it's just, it's just it just uh, enacts its own rules. Therefore, it cannot enforce any jurisdictional, any uh, compliance requirements. So what you then have is a, is a situation, a social situation, where Bitcoin attracts the kind of people who are like down with the state, down with the dollar. Let's replace everything with Bitcoin. Let's get rid of dollars. Let's get rid of borders. Let's get rid of economic differences and use Bitcoin for everything. Let's use Bitcoin as the monetary standard. Now, um, so that's one push. And there's a reason why that Bitcoin community has been so self-selective. It's because technically, architecturally, they're unable to, uh, to handle the, the compliance requirements. In contrast, we started from the ground up with uh, an approach that was multi-chain, where each and every one of those chains could be, could be specialized for different applications and for different legal requirements. And as a result, we ended up at a very different place. So we, we welcome diversity. We welcome differences. It's okay if uh, India has different rules. It's okay to us that, uh, that, uh, that people in, in Manhattan, people on Wall Street, just right outside here, um, have, uh, have different requirements. We can accommodate them. And we've been working with JP Morgan, with Apollo, with BlackRock to build systems that are compliant, to build chains tailored to their use cases that are compliant. And I'm really proud of those uh, those, uh, those um, uh, efforts, uh, and, and I'm really proud of the way we've been trying to bring real-world assets onto the chains uh, in a compliant manner. Yeah, this is so interesting. Let me ask you a question about the architecture and how this works in the multi-chain world in Avalanche. Uh, one of the things that folks uh, obviously know is that decentralization helps to provide security in the network. So if you have a series of different chains, is there a common security architecture throughout it? Uh, or do you need to essentially have scale on each one of those additional chains to provide security for consensus? Great question. And uh, this is where a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, experts differ. And this is where Avalanche took a unique path. Prior to Avalanche, almost everybody wanted something called shared security. What does shared security mean? They want everybody to be as decentralized as everybody else. So how do you do that? Well, then the, there's only one way to do that, right? So that is to say, well, um, the, the way to do this is, uh, is to, uh, to have one big validator set across the globe and have all of these chains share the same validator set. That way, you know that uh, you know the X, you know the the A chain is as good as the B chain is as good as the C chain, and now you can make some simplifying assumptions because you know the properties of the A chain, the security properties of the A chain, and you know that they're no different than the security properties of the B chain, and that's a that's a legitimate way to approach this. By the way, I, b I believe that this is the way that Cosmos and Polkadot are structured. Exactly, exactly, um, and. Uh, especially Polkadot, right? So, um, so if you go down this road, though, it's, it's a little misguided. So what ends up happening is this. Because you're sharing the same set of computers at the end of the day, you have a real big problem when it comes to, first of all, performance. Because these chains are all running on the same machines, if one of them is congesting the machines, then it affects implicitly and indirectly all the other chains on that, on that set of validators. So that's a big, big problem. One of the main reasons why you actually want to have different chains is to isolate the applications from each other. I don't want a game that goes really popular on Avalanche to cause everybody else's experience to deteriorate. So we had a lot of uh, discussions with the Polkadot folks in our early days who kept saying shared security, shared security, and we kept saying, no, that's not desirable. You want performance isolation. You want fee isolation. And you guys don't have either of these things. So that's one. Two, if you have the same validator set, your legal requirements, how are they going to be enforced? For, for example, let's take the case of a country that wants to issue its own CDBC, Central, Central Bank 
um, uh, central bank uh, issued coin. So they would want to have some legal legal foundation that goes down to all of the nodes that comprise the system. So go talk to any any lawmaker, any any lawyer, and they will say, look, you need to have some control uh, over the, the the set of nodes that comprise your system, that make up your system. And uh, if you are instead sharing that big global network, you can't do that. Um, so by sharing that network, you buy back into that crazy libertarian ideology that says, oh, everybody must be as decentralized as everybody else. Not every application needs that level of decentralization. Not every application needs that client diversity. In fact, in many cases, it's not desirable. In many applications, for example, in the EU, the data cannot move outside of the EU. The GDPR requires that EU citizens' data stays inside the, the confines of the EU. So you want those validators to be in European countries. You can't move that data off of the EU the jurisdiction. So those systems with, quote, shared security cannot accommodate that. But Avalanche can because each and every one of our chains can have a different uh, validator set. But now let me, let me mention something uh, that, uh, that is the trade-off here. So Avalanche subnets and Avalanche chains on Avalanche are not as secure as, as each and every one of them. Right? So um, it's, it's then important to pay attention to what they really offer, to their terms of service, to their makeup. So, uh, so for example, uh, there are games on Avalanche that have on the order of 10 validators. Those are small, and I wouldn't keep huge amounts of value on those game networks. Uh, but then again, for, a game you know, for game purposes, it's perfectly fine. Um, and then there are chains on Avalanche that have huge numbers of validators where I am perfectly comfortable holding very, very large amounts of value. So um, Avalanche requires a little bit more, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more attention to which chain you're using and what its properties are. But at the same time, but the trade-off is it gives you the ability to have chains uh, that are specific to different use cases in a way that these shared security systems don't. That's very interesting. I, economics, computer science, engineering, no such thing as a free launch, always trade-offs. Uh, it's interesting to think that through uh, because you know I've talked about this here on the show before. You definitely have different levels of security uh, for different transactions that you provide right now. For example, I always talk about how when someone Venmos you money for dinner, uh, they can reverse the transaction that can be repudiated. It's an ACH transaction. It's not Fedwire. Uh, it's done net, not gross. It can be repudiated. Uh, but if, if someone stiffs me on a $100 check, I just don't have dinner with them again. Very different if I'm selling a house uh, and that transaction needs to be final so that I can go and buy the house that I'm going to move into next. Uh, so different cases with different securities are very interesting. I also have to ask you about an outage on the network. We talked about Solana uh, compared to, similar to Solana. They've had some outages on that network. In February, I believe there was a four-hour outage uh, where we couldn't get transaction finality on the Avalanche network. What happened there and has it been solved? Oh, it's been solved. It was a four-hour issue. We ended up uh, having a um, essentially a bug that uh, impacted the way our validators communicate with each other. Uh, it did not have anything to do with the consensus protocol in the background. It did not have any impact on anything other than all of our validators decided to say the same thing repeatedly to each other um, for a very long time. And, uh, and so, um, so we, uh, we, uh, the system stopped uh, finalizing transactions for about four hours. And, um, and uh, there was a sort of a, a, a team that was uh, a, a, an emergency response team that was formed. And uh, uh, they immediately looked into the extent of the problem, uh, exactly what it affected. They spent some time ensuring that, there, they, that this problem wasn't masking an, any other problems. And uh, so we take our time with these things. We could have easily reset the whole network, but we wanted to make sure that we did a thorough job of investigation. And... Um, and uh, we determined that it was indeed just a bug, this one bug that was introduced in, uh, when we were introducing these optimizations, or so some optimizations to the gossip layer, and, um, and we fixed it. So, uh, so that, uh, that bug is eradicated, and uh, I'm proud to say that that's only the second time that we encountered what we would call a severity one issue in the three and a half years of our operation. Um, I think... You know, look, anytime you're building a, a high performance system, you're going to you're going to be pushing the boundaries. Or anytime you, you develop new science, a new kind of system, you're gonna be pushing the boundaries. If you want to build 
you know, if you want to build a steam engine today, you'll be able to build it, right? If you want to build an internal combustion engine, it'll be okay. If you want to build a self-driving electric car, that's a different issue. There's going to be, you're going to run into things that nobody else has run into. So I fully expect that, uh, you know, there's a reason why Solana was having two outages a month for some time, right? They were pushing so many boundaries. They were doing so many optimizations to get that performance that they were, they were making mistakes. And, uh, you know, and there were quite a few of them uh, for a while. So that'll happen. Um, I am really proud that we only had two uh, in, uh, in the three and a half years that we've been up. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, that's, uh, and I'm, I'm really, really happy that they were resolved, both of them, without any impact on, uh, uh, on, uh, on any, any accounts, any balances, et cetera, et cetera, did not cause any issues for anyone. That's an important point. Let's talk a little bit about that. What happened to the transactions that were in the mempool? Were there any losses uh, in terms of accounts? Uh, were the transactions ultimately finalized uh, in a way that resolved them in the order that they were meant to be executed? Yes. So uh, whenever there is a system outage, of course, you worry about uh, you worry about everything that was in the mempool and uh, you worry about finalizing things. So what you do, of course, is uh, you bring the system back up, um, you being the set of people who comprise the system, it's a distributed effort. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so it's, it's not as easy as one would imagine. Um, the more centralized the system is, the easier this, this process gets, of course. Um, but uh, uh, so you, you uh, bring the system back, and um, in our case, as soon as it came back, it cleared all everything that was in the mempool. Once the gossip uh, issue was fixed, then uh, the communication was much more efficient as it should have been, and, uh, and then everything got, uh, got sorted out. I mean, I know you guys are working on some new technology uh, right now to upgrade the network. Let's talk a little bit about Durango, Warp Messaging, uh, and Ava Cloud. Uh, these are some of the new technologies that you guys are working on. Talk about what they are and why it might improve the experience of end users. Sure. Um, one of our big focuses uh, this year is uh, interchain communication. What, what we envision is a world of many, many, many chains all acting as one. Uh, if you have a service, you should not have to share a chain with anyone else. Your service should be on its own, in its own universe, charging its own gas fees, not affected by anything else that's happening on the network, and yet able to tap into the resources that are available on other people's chains. So that's sort of the vision. And Durango was a big step towards this vision because it introduced this new thing called Teleporter. What Teleporter does is it gives the users the ability to send a message from one chain to another. When might uh, this be useful? Take, for example, a DEX. Normally, on, let's say, Ethereum, on a conventional system or an older system like Ethereum or Solana, a DEX would operate on the main chain. They only have one chain. So the DEX shares the block space with everything else happening on that chain. So on Ethereum, NFTs are being issued. People are playing games. There's also stuff happening. And meanwhile, there's a DEX sort of ticking along there. On Avalanche, a DEX like that would have its own chain, would be on a separate, uh, on a separate timeline, on a separate blockchain, uh, where it charges its own fees. And uh, because that chain is not congested by other applications, uh, it would not be subject to fee spikes when, let's say, there's an NFT release at the same time. That's one big difference. And what, what Teleporter does is it allows that particular DEX chain to communicate with the main chain where the, where the resources, where the assets are. So, for example, the Dexalot chain, or the Dexalot system, uh, is a system that straddles the C chain on Avalanche and their own chain. What they do is uh, they, they accept um, the assets to be traded on the C chain. They keep the assets on the C chain, but the trading happens on their own chain. And uh, the trading happens with tiny, tiny fees, like a fraction of a cent. And they don't, uh, they are not affected by anything else that happens on any, on, in the rest of the Avalanche ecosystem. So that's a, a big, big, uh, and of course, once your trading is done and you want to take your assets back out, then Teleporter can take a message from their chain back to the C chain where the assets are released back to you. I mean, I know this gets complicated from a systems flow perspective, but can you walk us through a toy example or two from the end user perspective about what new functionality might be added or improved under the new model you just described. 
That's a great uh, question. I think uh, from the end user perspective, the, um, the functionality ought to be that you interact with super fast blockchain services and you don't even know or you realize that they're operating on different chains, that you just get, uh, get uh, cheap service. You get very, very uh, fast response time. You get very fast um, user experience. You get a very, very snappy user experience and uh, you're isolated from load on the network, on the rest of the network. For example, very soon, we're going to have uh, one of, in fact, very recently we had Shrapnel come on. It's a AAA game. It's uh, where the assets are on chain. Um, very soon we're going to have Off the Grid come online with, uh, with a huge amount of users, I hope, and we suspect. Um, and uh, uh, again, um, recently we had Korea, uh, SK um, Korea. The SK is the, one of the biggest companies in Korea. They brought on about three and a half million users. And... Um, all of these users are on a different chain, on a different subnet, and they perform their operations to do whatever the heck they want to do. And not one of them is subject to the fee spikes uh, that, uh, that we would encounter had they been sharing the same chains. And for folks who aren't familiar with the gaming universe, uh, talk a little bit about, about what you mean by on-chain. Do you mean the actual uh, gameplay is on-chain or is it ownership? Uh, of different utility functions that are on chain. How does that work uh, for people who aren't gamers? This is a, a huge, huge universe. Uh, if you're not a gamer, uh, your kids or your grandkids probably are. Yes, yes. So, uh, so I, I, I am. I was not a gamer myself, and uh, uh, but uh, as soon as we went out with the Avalanche architecture, uh, we ended up getting queries from people who wanted to build uh, next generation games on top of a blockchain, and they, they, what appealed to them was our ability to give them an isolated environment where their users could own their assets, their game assets, and, uh, and those assets would be under their control, and they, the fees and so forth would be, under, uh, would be uh, isolated from the rest of the activity on the system. And what makes this so exciting is, I just to give people a, a little bit of a thumbnail sketch, is that this means that essentially you would own uh, your own character, you would own your own level of progress, you would own uh, your own swords, your own shields, whatever the things that are associated with the game are, you would actually own them independently in a way that a centralized game developer wouldn't. That would mean you could, uh, for example, keep them when the game changed, upgraded, you could sell them, you could trade them, uh, and you could do it in a way that was independent of a centralized third party, a major shift from where we are today. Exactly. So um, I think everybody who's played any game for any length of time knows that at some point the game just disappears under you because you don't own the game. You don't own the assets in the game. They belong to the centralized entity that operates the game. When you move up, when you move to a blockchain infrastructure, then that ownership belongs to you. And uh, the, the, there is no operator, so to speak, but there is instead the game developer who essentially proposes changes to the network. Now, uh, there are some really, really fun games coming that have come up on, on, uh, on Avalanche, and there are some in the pipeline. I alluded to two of them. One of them is Shrapnel, which is a first-person shoot-em-up. It's kind of like Call of Duty. And uh, then there is uh, Off the Grid. It's a game that um, I actually played. I, they invited me to their studios. I'd never been to a AAA game studio before. It's a sight to see, Ash. I've never seen something like this. Um, you enter, as soon as you step in, there's 3D printed guns everywhere. And uh, turns out that the, um, the head of gun design, this is a title, it's a job, this, a job, job title. The head of gun design at, at, uh, at uh, Off the Grid is the same person from uh, who did all the guns on Call of Duty, and um, uh, and I asked him uh, if he ever considered working for a gun company, and he was like, well, why, "Why would I do that? That just seems so boring. I'd be I'd be limited <laughs> in what I could do." So in any case, um, they have these amazing guns, amazing uh, clothing, and uh, and they have architects, full time architects building virtual landscapes, uh, and it's it's a fascinating universe. Um, off the Grid is a battle royale type of game. Uh, once again, you run around on this island. Um, and, uh, you know, oh, the cool part about that game is um, essentially it's set in the future where um, people just voluntarily get rid of their arms and legs and uh, you instead uh, pluck in, you know, uh, these uh, synthetic, these robot arms and legs. If you kill someone, you can steal their arm if it's better than yours. And uh, they have all different functionality. All of these are, of course, in-game assets, and uh, they're all stored on the blockchain. 
And uh, should the game change or disappear under you, well, then you can still play it because the assets are yours. And more importantly than this, I think we're all familiar with the Marvel Universe, with the DC Comics Universe, etc. And uh, uh, so there are, there are now universes of, uh, of, uh, you know, of games that, share, that can share the same assets where you could launch a game where you, for example, des design, earn, etc., certain assets, and I could launch a game that shares those assets with you, where you take it from one universe to another. There's some continuity in the asset ownership between different games. I'm really, really excited. I should mention for the audience that um, for the off-the-grid game, they made me an NPC in the game. Uh, for those of you who might not be gamers, apparently that means non-player character. So, uh, so I'm in that game and I do this really dramatic, like, do you know who I am? I was there when we invented the future. So that's, that was my line. I say more stuff, um, but you can, Pretty good you know, line. it's a cool line. And, uh, and if, uh, if, if anybody wants to, they can go to wherever they will, they will put me in the game. You can shoot at me and so forth. I will respawn and say the same stuff again, but, uh, this is a fantastic game. I played it for 20 minutes. I was addicted. I now have dreams where I'm running in that universe again. And I can't wait for it to, uh, to launch on Xbox and a bunch of other places. It's going to be the first Xbox-launched blockchain game. I'm really proud that they're using uh, the Avalanche architecture. It's the only one that makes sense for this use case. And of course, as always, don't be an NPC in your own life. <laughs> I, listen, I wanted to ask you just about where we are. We're taping here on March 20, 2024. Obviously, price action throughout the space uh, has been crazy. Bitcoin trading at about uh, 63000 right now. Major run up uh, in the wake of the flow of funds uh, into the ETFs in the space here in the U.S. Obviously, price action has just been real choppy all over the place, highly volatile, but on net, uh, a very, very good 12 months uh, for the digital asset ecosystem across the board. Uh, a very good 12 months for uh, AVAX up uh, more than double, I think, from its lows up about 5x. I mean, it's just a lot of volatility. How do you think about price uh, in a world like today uh, that we live in? Uh, how do you think about it? Well, uh, I try not to think about it much at all. Um, I think that the entire space is an incredibly undervalued. And uh, so, uh, I mean, this is a very long conversation. And um, uh, let me try to sort of uh, take a, a couple of stabs at it. So there is some social or there was some social backlash against the space that was created partly because of the, uh, the sort of social aspects of, uh, of the early systems, right? The Bitcoin folks, they were not trying to make friends. Let's just put it that way, right? So if you go out and say down with all states, down with the dollar, et cetera, et cetera, um, the regulators will look, will look at you kind of funny. Um, and, uh, and you ended up getting a whole lot of regulators who are trying to kill the space off. And the, the regulators miscalculated and um, the space is too, too big. And the functionality it brings, the new things you can do here is, are just too valuable. And if anybody has any experience on Wall Street with what they actually use for accounting, what they use for reconciliation, what they use for automated services, what we can do in crypto is miles ahead of it. And you just go look at their systems, layers upon layers. They're trying to still uh, employ COBOL programmers for, uh, for keeping their systems up. And, and, and then take a look at a system, a modern system like, Bit, uh, like, uh, like uh, Avalanche or Ethereum. It's just miles ahead. So... Um, so there is still some social backlash and people don't quite see the value. And in fact, a lot of the anti-crypto arguments I hear are really arguments to, uh, against the systems from, let's say, five, six years ago. They, don't, they are not caught up. They don't know what a smart contract uh, chain can do for them. They haven't really seen a lending platform and how easy it is to use. They don't understand the, the efficiencies that uh, flash loans can bring to finance. So these are really amazing. And uh, they don't understand the democratization that this space brings. I remember, for example, when I was a grad student and uh, I wanted to do some, uh, some, uh, some connection to, uh, to get a feed, a uh, price feed from, uh, from NASDAQ, and it cost $150,000. So a price feed from Avalanche is free. Everybody has access to it at the same time, essentially. There's no difference between different players. So we used to have a system that was that was uh, uh, stovepiped and, and only big players were allowed. And now suddenly anybody and everybody can connect. So these are huge transformative things. 
And I think society is way behind on the value proposition offered by, by these new systems. It's not all about, you know, whatever, eight pictures and stuff. It's not all about speculation. There's something fundamentally different about the way we build services. Compare this, for example, to Web2. Almost all day, right, these lawmakers are upset at some Web2 operator. These people are kind of like, who is Zuckerberg? In, you know, 500 years ago, he would, be a, he would have a fiefdom, right? He operates the fiefdom. And if you want him to do something differently, then you have to just deal with him and bicker with him and call him to Congress and get him to testify. And it's just a terrible way of doing things. Whereas with transparent services on chain, we can offer a much better reality to people. So I don't think it has sunk in yet that crypto is here to stay and it's so much better. So the valuation of the entire space, I think at this point in time is missing a zero or two. So we are way below what, where we could be um, if, if people realize the societal impact that the space could have. That's my take. I don't opine on a Vox price, um, but, uh, but the space I think in general is, is incredibly undervalued and, uh, and, uh, and slowly but surely society will catch up and realize, okay, yes, as with any space, there was speculative activity in the early days. As with any space, there were bad actors, especially in the, in the early days. Uh, but, but as with everything that is transformative, it, it has immense potential value. And in speaking of a zero or two, uh, let's talk about zeros to the right of the decimal point uh, and talk about meme coins. Uh, this is obviously a topic uh, that has been very much in the news lately. Some meme coins right now on the Avalanche Network, Kimbo, uh, Coke, Inu, Gecko, uh, No Chill, uh, a lot of other uh, of these because I don't really understand them. I've never really understood them. Whenever I look at a price on Coin Gecko and I see a subscript number, so if you're there, this is the number of zeros to the right of the decimal point. There are five, seven, nine leading zeros in some of these coins, uh, meaning uh, you know negative powers of ten in terms of the price uh, of a cent. How do you think about meme coins? Uh, what do you think they mean? And are they significant in your view? Great question. So look, I, I was a professor at Cornell for 20 years, right? And what did I learn? So you know, what, what does that prepare you for? It makes you a very sort of a very conservative person when it comes to financial stuff, which is what I am. And uh, you know, I don't trade, I don't buy and sell and do crazy degen things. Um, and so my first reaction when I saw meme coins was, what the heck are these? They are clearly worthless. Why would anybody buy them? Why would anybody sell them? And they are kind of useful, right? Um, Dogecoin is a meme coin, right? And um, in the old days, I used to, uh, I used to tell students, you know, students would come to me and say, hey, I'm really excited about, uh, say, Bitcoin at the time. I'd be like, oh, okay, great. So uh, you probably don't want to, uh, to, to do things with your Bitcoin. You know, just it's expensive to acquire. And, uh, and so, so instead of Bitcoin, you can play with Doge, right? And then suddenly people started putting huge amounts of, of money. They, there are people who put their life savings into Dogecoin, into the dog that talks funny, right? So, um, and it always kind of perplexed me. Like, why would anybody do this? What's in it? In what's, what's happening here, etc. But having been in this space so long, um, I came to understand what these things really represent. They represent cultural movements, subcultures within the crypto community. And... Um, and, and one other thing that I have learned uh, by being a professor, by, by being so close to young people for a long time, is to never underestimate effects of culture, effects of, uh, of social groups communicating with each other, having fun, doing silly things. And uh, so this is what people do, and they love to do it. And if there is, it's like a steamroller. You can't say, hey, young people, don't do this. Like that's the, the, the most uncool thing anybody could say. So people enjoy buying and trading these things. Now, how do you buy and trade these things? Is there any societal value that comes out of this? That's a question one could ask. Um, and, uh, and so there, there, there's something interesting there too. So to make money with meme coins, you really have to be well connected. You really have to be hip. You really have to have your ear to the ground. You have to be so well connected that you know uh, when, when some you know, coin like, let's say, Kakinu, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's currently worth 10, 0.000, 000 seven zeros and, and, and one, and it's going to go to you know, four zeros and one, right? It's gonna, it's gonna go 1,000 X or so, let's say. I'm just making stuff up, um, the numbers up. But, uh, 
So to, to know which ones are going to make it and which ones are not, you really have to have a very good sense of, um, of social connectivity. And the people who do have that, the people who are opinion makers, taste makers, the people who, who are really good followers, who, who have that extra perceptive sense, they are the ones who, who really enjoy this game and they are the ones who have a leg up. And, uh, and then there are a bunch of aspiring people who, who, who play the same game and who try to get better at it. So at the end of the day, it's like trading cards, right? You know, people used to trade cards when I was in elementary school, uh, the little, little playing cards with cars on them. Uh, I think in the U.S. everybody trades uh, baseball players. So, you know, it's, it's just like that. And uh, if you're having fun with it, you're having fun with it. And who am I or anybody else to tell you that, that you shouldn't or couldn't? It's, uh, of course, you should be allowed to do it. Well, that's very well uh, framed. And I definitely don't ever want to be the guy, you know, shaking his finger and saying, you know, you, you kids, you can't do this. Uh, but um, obvious point that needs to be made, highly, highly, highly speculative activity. <laughs> Absolutely. To put it mildly. Absolutely. Hey, let's shift gears here and close out a little bit uh, talking about how you think uh, of community and governance in the Avalanche space. Talk a little bit about the current governance structure, how you see it today, and where you see it evolve into tomorrow. So let's see. Um, when we started down this whole path of, uh, of, of Avalanche, uh, uh, so building Avalanche, uh, there were really three things that that uh, that we were really excited about. Number one was our consensus protocol, which is supremely fast and it's using a different technology than everybody else in the space. Um, so it's a huge advancement. Uh, the second one was the architecture with multiple chains. The third one was going to be governance. And um, that we've explored um, in private, we've explored uh, a bunch of things that we could do on the governance side. But... Uh, the regulatory frameworks around governance are not so clear. So uh, if your token is a governance coin, or if your token can be used to vote on system changes, it is not so clear how the regulators view it. So uh, we've, uh, we've been, uh, we have not rolled out automatic on-chain governance features on Avalanche. And um, uh, Ethereum has followed a different path, but has come to the same conclusion, that they don't want to have on-chain governance. And uh, so, um, at the moment, we are a community, and uh, we are a very big community. Uh, the, uh, uh, the governance of it is essentially unstructured. The, um, like with every peer-to-peer -peer system, how the system behaves is not a top-down dictated property. It's an emergence property. Um, just like the United States, right? You have a whole lot of incentives at play, and then we as a society do certain things. You know, in the 60s, we went to the moon. These days, we're trying to go back to the moon. And in the middle, we, we, that kind of activity stopped and we started doing other things. So, um, so Avalanche is similar in the sense that, uh, that uh, we have an emergent network. The network operates by a whole set of different actors with different economic interests or different interests in general, and some not economic uh, that come together and build build sub communities in it. Uh, the memesters are there. The ordinals inscribers are there. Uh, people building real world assets are there. Wall Street people are there. And I'm really proud of the diversity of people who have come onto our chain who are using it for such different purposes. And that's really uh, that's really the exciting thing about it. Um, it has the downside compared to a centralized system. You know, I sometimes think about the the people at Apple Pay or you know, at Google Pay and so on. They have, a, they have such an easy life compared to me. And uh, they know exactly what to change to get what effect. Uh, they know exactly, you know, they are full in, in full control of their platform. Uh, we are not, right? We, every change we have to do has to go through the, uh, the Avalanche community proposal process. So this is a process where um, essentially anyone on earth can propose a change and everybody has a voice and they get to decide. And uh, at the end of the day, um, the, 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 the proposed changes might be adopted by the community or might not. And there is not a single person on earth who is in command of that. It is an emergent property. So I'm really excited and, um, and really fascinated by what we've done so far uh, with the community being so strong and so diverse across all these verticals. And I can't wait to see what, that, what the future holds for us. Let me ask you one more question before we do our key takeaways here from today, uh, which is you talk about this system, the emergent properties of the system, the community 
uh, base system, how it's decentralized. What worries you? What concerns you? What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Uh, so many things. I, I'm <laughs> so there are lots of different types of founders, I guess. So, so uh, I, I worry about everything on, and and anything and everything. And um, as a result, I we we're doing a hell of a lot of things across the board. I think my my greatest worry with this space is the emergence of of bad actors that give crypto a bad name. I know how much I suffered. Indirectly, I mean, we had nothing to do with the FTX saga, but FTX ended up hitting all of us. And um, I know how much we all suffered reputationally. I know that the the the, uh, the focus on crypto from regulators and others um, is, is is a direct result of these bad actors. I worry about. I mean, this might sound kind of crazy, but I worry about bull bull markets where there's great exuberance and the fundamental differences between projects are lost and all that matters is the narratives is the is the noise they make on social media so that's really disconcerting to me because people with merit people who have actual new um new things to bring to the space actual new technology to bring to the space get drowned out compared to people who have nothing whatsoever who make noise in fact they're at a disadvantage because you know, if you if you've got nothing at all, you can say whatever you like. There are there are projects out there that were copying us and saying all sorts of crazy things. Uh, there were we are the most copied project, by the way, in all of crypto. There were people who were uh, putting out products, and uh, instead of documenting their their products were a copy of ours, and instead of documenting their product, they would put a, a pointer to our our documentation. Um, so. <laughs> It's, I, I, don't, I don't like universes like that where, where people with merit, people with connections, people with real lives and, and, and careers and so forth um, are on the same platform as, as a bunch of hucksters who are going to be here today and gone in a bear market. Those are my biggest worries. Um, other than that, I think this space is destined for growth. I'm really excited about uh, what is to come. We saw with the ETFs that there's great demand, far more than I thought, by the way. The, the ETF demand has been fantastic to see. And all of, the, um, all of my friends on Wall Street keep telling me that uh, the BlackRock ETF is more successful than every other ETF BlackRock has ever done. And in fact, it's more successful than all other ETFs BlackRock has done combined, summed up. So, uh, so there's been a lot of pent-up demand for crypto. Um, so, and I know what, what fundamental changes these things bring. I alluded to them earlier, compared to the bitemporal databases that people use on Wall Street, compared to their crappy systems that are all disparate and they have to be reconciled, etc. cetera. Um, crypto is a fundamental improvement. It's here to stay. And maybe I should say one more thing. Um, you know, back when, uh, when I was a tiny kid, right? And I was in middle school when I first saw a, a personal computer. Um, those were independent, separate you know, desktop computers, right? So, and then we went through the desktop computing breakthrough. It was a fundamental breakthrough. Then in the 90s, we went through the web explosion. And what is, what is the World Wide Web? The World Wide Web is a client server system. You and I are clients and, uh, and Facebook is a server. Zuckerberg owns the, owns the servers and Google owns a set of other servers that we all interact with and so on. That's kind of like the feudal feudal phase of the growth of computer networks. Blockchains are the Byzantine fault tolerance era. It's the third and final architecture in the evolution of computer systems where you don't have a single centralized server, where you have a, a set of computers operating together, where some of them might even be Byzantine. They might engage in, in trickery to try to get ahead, and yet the system will still behave and hold, hold up a certain a set of guarantees, even in the presence of bad actors. So this is inevitable. It's coming. And, um, and if you don't believe any of the mumbo jumbo, you know, I, I ended up using some technical terminology like Byzantine. Um, just, just look at like all these millennials and, and Gen Zers who have seen NFTs, who've played with them and so forth. And, and ask yourself the question, suppose crypto disappears tomorrow. Um, in, in 20 years, when, when these folks are in, in a position to make, make decisions, what will they do? Will they, will they be sufficient with owning a Charles Schwab account? Was that what they are going to want to do? Or will they bring back this, these open systems 
where anyone can trade, where there is no friction, there are no middlemen uh, that, uh, that, that, have to, that you have to go through to access your resources? I think the answer is clear to me. So for both technical and social reasons, this revolution is here to stay. It's fascinating to see. And uh, it'll be noisy, as you mentioned. This particular bull, bull run is going to be a noisy cycle. Uh, but as always, the folks with, uh, with the technological uh, leg up will be the ones that, that end up at the, at the front, forefront of the race. Boy, that's so well said. Uh, you know, for folks uh, our age, Emin, uh, we've seen these cycles happen before. I think uh, for people who are technically inclined like you and me, uh, that first experience of seeing a personal computer when you were a kid, maybe in the 80s or 90s, was just such an overwhelming experience. And then to see that template repeated uh, with the internet revolution, with the mobile revolution. Uh, it's the feeling that I have when I look at this space. But uh, to your point, boy, this is a space with some dizzying highs uh, and some heartbreaking lows. Uh, you point out FTX, my viewers can see on the shelf behind me, uh, the book that uh, I wrote uh, with uh, our producer, Arthur Osinski and Elizabeth Bachman about uh, the FTX debacle. Uh, in many ways, I think uh, an incident that shows uh, that centralization uh, and the flaws that we've seen in the business world, whether it's uh, Enron or pick another example of a corporate fraud, uh, the problem was centralization. The problem was uh, the fact that human beings being human beings will do what they do. The promise of cryptocurrency, and I think we're still a ways away from being able to realize it, uh, is to have systems that are truly decentralized, truly transparent, uh, where the shenanigans that happened at FTX could never be replicated. I hope we get to that phase. I think that's a thing that people like you and I are really passionate about and certainly want to see develop such a great conversation. So many points we've touched on deep and wide here on the technology, on the legal aspect of it, the regulation, the financial component. Final thoughts, key takeaways that you'd like to leave our listeners and our viewers with. Sure. Um, so let's see. Uh, number one key takeaway is crypto is here to stay. And uh, I hope uh, everybody sees with me that, uh, that this technology is unstoppable and provides so many societal benefits that, uh, that not only is it here to stay, but we should welcome it uh, with open arms because it has the potential to change the way businesses work, to bring transparency and auditability into every aspect of, of, of life, and also uh, to, uh, to, to just lubricate everything financial and make everything more efficient. Second takeaway is that Avalanche is different. It brings to the crypto space a different ethos. It is not only technologically superior. In fact, it, is the, it, it brought a, a revolutionarily new approach to consensus. But also, it is architecturally different. It provides uh, people the ability to build their own blockchains with their own rules, which allows, in turn, ecosystems to emerge on top. And, uh, and then third and final... Uh, um, takeaway, I think, is that this this uh, this creates a new exciting area um, where um, where there are many many different verticals. We have real world assets. We have the the institutions playing you know, issuing um, creating their own subnets. We have gaming uh, uh, companies issuing AAA games and so forth. And I could go on. And SocialFi, of course, is taking place on Avalanche. So it's a really exciting future uh, where um, I think. Our approach, um, even though, you know, I remember how many arrows I took from my colleagues, from other people who were entrenched um, that, uh, that kept telling me, look, your approach to consensus is not going to work. Your approach, your architecture is just, you know, da, 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 this missing shared security, this and that. I think over time, um, unlike many other projects, Avalanche is unique in a couple of ways. We are not only the most copied, but we're one of the systems that has not had to pivot Every other day, when, uh, when its last, last direction did not pan out, we've been on the same path from the get-go with an unwavering vision of building multiple chains that serve different needs that interoperate. And if you believe in that future, I would love to see you on our chain. Emin Gunsir, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully we can do this again soon. Thank you so much, Ash. Pleasure to chat with you. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.